thank you so much to Diana, Isais, and Giovanni for joining us today. I'm going to first begin with Diana Benavidez, who's joining us from San Diego. She's going to be sharing her work uh, and her very political and expansive take on what pinatas can be. And I do want to say in terms of the exhibition, that really is what we wanted to can highlight is, is the idea that pinatas are this art category that has so much potential and it ranges from the functional traditional pinatas to the um, art and sculptural and conceptual incarnations of pinatas. And Diana, your work is, is perfectly on, on that spectrum of, um, of the conceptual and political aspects of pinatas. So thank you so much. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Diana Benavides. I'm a binational artist from the San Diego Tijuana border region. I am currently based in San Diego, California. And just like my other fellow artists we're presenting today, my art practice involves uh, utilizing the piñata as a form of storytelling or reflect upon my experiences um, growing up in the militarized border. Um, let me see. So um, I like to present my artwork or my art practices using the, the piñatas in four different ways. I see the piñata as an object of resistance, as an object of destruction, and as an object of traditional reversal, as well as an object of mockery. Um, since 2015, um, my work as an artist has focused on extending the presence of an ephemeral object like the piñata. Um, I feel like I'm, by embarking upon this delirious task, I've worked with the piñata to magnify taboo subjects surrounding the female body, to reflect upon growing up Catholic, and to tell stories about our Mexican-American militarized border. Despite being an object of you know, traditionally designed for celebration. I also work the skin and form of the piñata to invoke feelings of disconformity and anguish. And, you know, this kind of complicates the emotional role of the piñata and people, usually the audience will question its purpose as an object to be destroyed. Um, I like to always bring a visual of like satellite views of what really brings some inspiration to my work. Um, these satellite views are from the Tijuana San Diego border. Um, the top image kind of shows a good uh, visual of how the top side, which is the American side, is more like, you know, more open, and the Mexican side is a little bit more overcrowded, more overwhelming. The bottom uh, image shows the actual physical border that divides the land. And it's quite an impressive uh, image because you can see how the border plunges into the ocean, 30 feet into the ocean. So definitely um, I like to present this because a lot of people sometimes uh, don't know where uh, this actual physical wall is. As an artist, I also take the time to uh, document the border. Um, I go down there, I like to uh, document the interactions that individuals have with the physical border. I've seen uh, how individuals can uh, basically uh, challenge uh, the fancy technology that is set in the border to surveil it. Um, it's also a great place for families to interact with each other. Um, in the top, I mean, the bottom left side, we see a family communicating via phone, but they're visually seeing each other from across the border. So there's definitely a lot of politics and poetry in this region. Another source of inspiration for me is the uh, feminist wave in Latin America. Um, most of Latin American countries are very conservative, so there aren't that many laws that protect female reproductive rights um, or a lot of uh, women's rights in general. Um, so definitely um, these are two of the most um, important things that draw inspiration to my work. So the piñata is an object of resistance. Um, can an object that insists its continued existence serve as a form of protest? 
Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> In 2016, I created a body of work called um, Asking For It. And it was basically a, a series of works of um, objects and products of domesticity that are small in size, but hefty in social political uh, issues. And I, a lot of like, uh, you know, scale, form and color were essential in developing this body of work because uh, you know, I was trying to explore the conception behind the products presented. When amplified in the form of a piñata, the aesthetics of the designs reveal the conservative views and expectations of the female body. So we see a lot of pastels, lights, uh, light whites and in the color palette of these works. Um, and you know, these objects are designed to be discreet or invisible. Um, so by amplifying them in scale, uh, it was great for the audience to kind of like reflect on the on their personal rela relationship with these objects. Um, I like to add a lot of text to my artwork. Um, I feel like it's another way for me to make a statement over, you know, on top of the object itself. Um, so I will often add um, you know, a short phrase or a poem over a body of work that I create. Um, the piñata is an object of destruction. Um, traditionally, piñatas have become one of the most anticipated moments in a birthday celebration. Um, but if, what if this moment of destruction was to illustrate pain instead of a celebration? Um, so I, in 2019, I created a body of work called The Piñata's Narrative. And I basically tried to, uh, well, I actually manipulated the physical body of a piñata in order to visually represent um, emotional states. I think one of the most common human experiences we all face is, um, you know, heartbreak, having a heartbroken. Um, to me, heartbreak is the equivalent of having a load of cinder, of cinder blocks dropped into my heart. So upon reflecting upon this, uh, you know, uh, sensation, I took the liberty to, um, you know, represent these some of those feelings through scale, through the manipulation of the artwork by just making really large uh, pieces. Uh, the piece that we see in the middle, um, and translating it in love with in love with an illusion that I do not dare to break. Um, it was basically a six feet by six feet wide tall uh, piñata that took over the whole gallery space. So kind of like uh, a good way to represent emotions to scale. Um, the piñata is an object of tradition reversal. Um, I often see building a piñata in order to break free from a tradition. Um, in 2020, I created this uh, 22 feet long uh, Catholic rosary that was um, installed at the St. James by the Sea Episcopal Church uh, Library. And it was a very challenging work um, because not only it was like blown up to scale, but also a rosary contains 63 beats. And to me, building this piñata was very emotionally and physically, uh, you know, it, it was just too much emotion in there. So it was a great way to, for me to, as a Mexican woman who grew up in the conservative Catholic church to kind of like release some of that emotional weight. Um, and then, you know, I often get asked, you know, how often, how long does it take to build a piñata? And, you know, that's kind of like a complicated question to answer because sometimes the building process takes place beyond, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, the, the physical assembly of the work. Uh, the piñata is an object of mockery. Over the years, the militarization of the border has also made its way into the landscape of my creative practice. Um, as I mentioned, the border is a major source of inspiration to my work. And this is where I can combine a lot of art and technology into my art practice. So um, this is a piece that I created in 2017. It's a piñata drone. <laughs> it's actually a cardboard structure um, that 
has uh, four small motors uh, engineered in there so that when plugged into electricity, the propellers move. So there's this movement going on. Um, and um, it's part of a kind of a performance piece. Uh, this is my friend Lana, one, you know, one of many times that we went down to the border, Borderfield State Park, which is actually where the satellite photos I presented earlier at. Um, we would take the, the, um, the drone and, you know, we like to document their people's reactions to the art piece. And, you know, some people would be, uh, you know, find it really funny. And then other people like the border patrol were very curious to know what we were doing. <laughs> and when we were asked if the, if the drone flew, um, obviously I answered that it conceptually flew and they didn't like that at all. <laughs> Um, I've also integrated a lot of other technology into my work, like projection mapping. This piece, Borderlands, um, has a video footage of um, iconic sites uh, of our border. One of the most iconic things about living in San Diego, Tijuana is traffic. I think in LA was also a thing, but um, you know, people who are in line for hours to cross to the United States side. It's one of the very iconic things that we have. So actually um, goes into what some of the pieces that are currently in display at Captain America Center. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, art and technology for this part is very important. I think for me is that I see that, um, you know, Piñatas are weighted by nature. So um, a piñata drone and this remote control cars are charged with a sense of mockery, which is very characteristic to Mexican humor. And as someone who's lived in both sides of the border, I firsthand witness individuals who have defied, you know, customs, systems of surveillance that are very fancy in technology. So it's kind of like proving the ineffectiveness of this sophisticated technologies. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like, um, for me, my projects, like the drone and the remote control cars are a way to kind of like, um, like my kitschy interpretation of uh, Mexican nation surveillance um, as a comic strategy to challenge public opinion on border politics and the effects of privacy. And also, I always see, I see these uh, three pieces that uh, the remote control cars is, um, you know, if I were to be playing a video game, these would be probably the three users that we would have. We would have a Pinche Negra, the Border Crosser. La Guayina is probably more uh, familiar to people who live in Tijuana because this was a very common um, means of public transportation down there. It was a station wagon that was turned into a, a taxi cab and um, so yeah it's really it's really great to see the reactions when we take these um, these vehicles down to you know drive them in the streets it's it's really wonderful to see people's reactions um but yeah this is basically my this is it any questions thank you so much for that just brief encapsulated version of your work, which has so many layers to it. Um, again, I encourage anyone to type into the Q&A or the chat. Uh, we can also revisit once um, you're all talking as a group, but you know, the idea of resistance, um, I, I think this is a great starting point for looking not just at this exhibition, which I think might surprise people on a lot of levels, um, what pinatas how they serve in, in terms of forms of resistance and how artists are interpreting them like you so brilliantly um, and instilling all these layers of politics into them um, and using them as objects for expression in such powerful and, um, and immediate kinds of ways. So thank you. We will talk more um, at the end. Next, I would like to invite Isais Rodriguez to join us. He's going to be presenting his work, which is a, a very different um, take on the pinata and different background. Isais is joining us from 
Fresno today. So our three um, speakers are scattered, not just um, in California, but also beyond. The exhibition features work largely of artists who are based here in, in California, but, but not exclusively. Um, to say your take is so poetic and um, encapsulates that as a, as a starting point for how people view Pinatas. So thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I just want to thank um, everyone for showing up today and all the artists. It's really honored to participate in this exhibition and, <clears throat> excuse me, activities like this. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about my background, a little bit about why I do what I do, and the impact of those actions. And uh, if there's any questions you all have, you know, I'd love to take them after, or after everyone else is uh, done presenting their work. So these are my little piñatas. So my little piñatas are something that I created over, oof, I think 18 years ago. I wanted to hang a little piñata in my car um, on the rearview mirror. And this is a picture of me when I'm four years old. This is a picture that I used um, for many years. I still use it a lot. And the reason why I use it is because it, it reminds me at four, four years old when you were, you believed in anything. Magic was just amazing. And the fantasy was limited by your imagination. And so as I get older, I use this picture to remind myself, don't ever forget about that moment in life so that I can stay grounded and I can keep my creativity going in a way that um, connects those fond memories as I get older, you know, of being a child and now an adult. So um, I'm number eight out of 12. Uh, grew up in Boyle Heights, California and uh, other parts of East LA. Um, that's my brother, Thomas. My sister Rachel behind me. I'm wearing that little trucker cap. And family was a big thing growing up. Um, working class, poor, you know, parents still together, raised Catholic. A lot of these things are very familiar with a lot of people of my generation who grew up during that time. And the piñata was something that was, as my sister Mary, me in the middle of my hair. Oof, look at that hair. And um, my brother Thomas, this is in Boyle Heights. You know, uh, the piñata was an amazing celebration. It was something that always brought joy um, in my family. It was uh, always brought at birthday parties and filled with so much candy and things that were always different. And being so many kids, there were a lot of piñatas that we, we had, you know, in our family. And you know, it was interesting to see how that impacted everyone too. There's a picture of my mom, my sister Mary, me and my brother Thomas. Uh, family means a lot to me too. I have two sons, ages 11 and eight, and um, being creative and connecting with them and creating experiences for them um, that are important, that, you know, invoke the positive emotions that hopefully they'll continue to share with other people and their, you know, their families and their communities, you know? So um, family being so big and being so um, supportive of what I was doing as a kid, you know, my creativity went all kinds of different places. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was that artist, I was that young mind that would go against the grain. I was that young kid that would see it different. I started to become that young Chicano who um, didn't agree with the world that was around me. And I wanted to reflect those things in a creative way through my art. And so um, the piñata was something that, like I said, um, I wanted to hang in my car. And I did, I, I, I came up with it. I successfully made a little piñata and um, I achieved my goal. That was its sole purpose. And what was really interesting is the journey that has happened since has been nothing I ever would have imagined. And that to me is the most amazing thing about life is the things you just do not anticipate, the unknown, um, the uncomfortable. And so 
My Little Piñatas turned into uh, these adorable little creatures that I made. These are the little burros you see right here. Uh, He says, we're having some trouble with your audio. Hiller, my work sold out and I was top merchant. And then I knew, wow, this is amazing. You know, people see value in what I do. And that's the shift that happened for me with my work. Because again, I told you, I didn't seek out to like make a business or to sell these things. These were, um, pieces of art that I would make that I get to sell. I get to share with the community. I get to talk about it. And um, it was different. It was a little piñata, something that people go like, what, little? How are you supposed to break it? What are you supposed to do with it? So it already started invoking questions. Um, its colorfulness is attractive. So people, again, are drawn to it. And its cultural reference is valued so people admire that as well so there's a lot of really interesting factors that go into my work specifically the little piñata that people see value in and thus is where i've been now in selling my work teaching workshops and utilizing it in ways to capture people's attention several years ago um, i caught the attention of the museum of ice cream of san francisco and made a limited edition burro, rainbow, and unicorn piñatas that were featured at the store, which was really cool. Um, it was interesting during that time how uh, my work shifted from just making, you know, small craft pieces, stuff that people would use for ornaments, you know, to now more bigger commercial um, and also political work in regards to being involved in art galleries and exhibitions. One great exhibition um, I was involved with was in New Mexico and it was a piñata exhibition. There I was able to go and um, spend about a week teaching um, teachers and children how to make little piñatas, teaching teachers how to teach kids how to make little piñatas. Um, it was amazing and it was great and I loved it. Um, I love how my art continues to just push me in areas that are uncomfortable, areas that are, are challenged, and, and, and the results are the work that I make. So I get to go into classrooms, uh, this is my son's classroom uh, one year, and we get to honor our dead by making our sugar skull little piñatas and talk about those that we loved and process as a community these stories, these emotions, and strengthen, you know, um, our relationship by doing these creative things. Um, I'm able to work with people like this in Oakland uh, at a hackathon to come up with um, an app for My Little Piñatas. Again, pushing me into creative new ways to connect with people, to celebrate art and culture, and to, um, to see things differently. That's what's really important for me. And um, this picture right here is a group of amazing creative people. Um, Sita, who's also part of the show, is part of this exhibition that she curated called We Are Against the Wall. And I created a little miniature scale version of the proposed border wall that Donald Trump wanted to, um, wanted to erect at the time. And created what you see in my hand, little pieces of the wall that I made a limited edition um, so again, like I said, during this time, my work started to break out into more political stuff. Um, that's a image of Donald Trump scale version of the wall. Those are the little bricks that I made with handmade barbed wire. This next piece you see here, uh, again, uh, speaks to um, what's important to me. This is an organization on Oakland where uh, their challenge was they had an object that they needed to cover which was this recorder and a microphone. And what they do, they go into Latino communities and they would record stories from immigrants about their travels, about their background, 
things that were important to them. Um, but the, their logo for their organization was an ear. Uh, I think they're called eardrum. So what I did was they wanted a piñata. So I took the ear and created this object you see here with the ear, the piñata, and it's over the actual microphone and device. So what was really neat is that this object is being placed in neighborhoods and communities so that the community come and approach it and speak into the ear, almost like they're whispering into the ear to record their story. And um, I look forward to seeing more pictures of that when people are actually doing that. But um, again, these opportunities, these things I'm showing you, just, you know, just show a shift in, in my work and what I'm trying to do in reaching the community and using um, the craft of piñata to get people's attention. And, and I love it because it's so approachable. You know, here I have a mounted unicorn piñata head. You know, this was an idea that I had um, just festering in my head. I was like, you know, all the piñatas that get cracked open and, you know, take thrown away it's sad you know it was a salvage at least the head you know so this was an idea that i did and um ended up selling them you know and people found that interesting which i'll actually be offering a new series too and the workshops i'm excited to do too you know uh being in class and offering what i know to those in in the, in the community i'm excited about um utilizing new technologies this is my little bitmoji uh, part of a story that I was talking about with um, my friend Poop Emoji. Um, so what's really cool is that the piñata goes beyond just the piñata. And um, like what I'm doing with Craft in America is offering a workshop uh, for you to make your own uh, burro or unicorn. And what you do is you make your piñata come to life with the story. And so this is a page of one of that story, um, my friend Poop Emoji. So. If you haven't signed up, there's a little plug, check it out on September 25th. Sign up and get your kits today is a deadline so that you can get it to your um, door at the right time. So check that out. So now to the present moment, resilience. So I was really excited to be a part of this show to continue expanding the craft of piñata, to uh, expand people's perception of piñatas, and to welcome more younger people to um, the arts and appreciating handmade work. Um, my piñatas, um, I have to hand cut all the tissue paper and, and assemble them by hand so, and paint them. A lot of hand work, those who know, know. <laughs> a lot of love, a lot of attention to bring these little butterflies to life. My work typically goes, um, the, like there's not a lot of text. I don't like to have a lot of words that go along with my work. As an artist, I like the visuals to speak to whoever they speak to, however they speak to, and allow their backgrounds and their experiences to invoke the emotions that are gonna bond that experience to whatever I'd like to share, share or show them. So I hope that you're able to come out to Craft in America before the show is done and check out Resilience, check out all the other artists that just makes such an amazing experience for this exhibition. He says that was beautiful. Um, I do wanna mention that there were some slides that uh, we had, there was an internet speed issue, I think, in terms of yeah. loading some of those images. So maybe we will revisit at the end. Um, okay. I think almost everything popped up in the end. Um, the only image that might not have, as far as I recall, was your image of the wall um, oh, okay. with Sita. And I do want to mention that um, that we do have, um, oh yes, and the sugar skulls. If we could maybe take a look at those right now, um, that would be great for a moment. Is that your sugar skull? Yes. Um, yeah. And I do also, yes, wanted to mention that that exhibition at the National Hispanic Cultural Center uh, in New Mexico is possibly the only other exhibition that we've found um, has ever taken place in the US really look at, looking at pinatas from this broad broad base. Um, oh great. And there's and there's Trump. And that, the total piece, how large is was that piece? It was about, about a little over 18 inches tall um, and about maybe 22 inches long. Great, excellent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. 
No problem. And thank you for um, bringing your incredibly poetic take on the pinata into, into the world, into this exhibition for that matter. You're welcome, thank you. We'll talk more as at the end. Um, next, I'd love to invite Giovanni Valderas, who's joining us from Texas, um, to share his work with us. Thanks so much, Giovanni. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation, Emily. Uh, the Craft and America Center, all the artists, uh, super excited to be here. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right into the, the presentation. So my name is Giovanni Valderas. I grew up in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, which is a predominantly Latino or Latinx community. Um, and grown up in, in Oak Cliff, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard not to be influenced by all the, the vibrancy, uh, the sensory overload that, that kind of happens, right? When we see brightly painted buildings and houses and, and, and even like the smells, right? When you're, when you're going down the street and you smell fajitas being grilled and the music coming out, you know, these were all things that affected my work as an artist and, and, and wanting to kind of absorb all those passions and also conflicts that come with that. And, and so I somehow uh, created a practice that, that centered around, you know, that the idea of a piñata and what that meant. I, I always thought the history was really fascinating, you know, and, and how, you know, traditional like um, culture and, and uh, different uh, things in Latin America and how the, how they were always appropriated by, by the Spanish and kind of co-opted to assimilate indigenous people. And I thought that how interesting that, the piñata was kind of similar to, right? These kind of traditions and, and how that was kind of used as a vehicle for subversion. And I thought about that today. And, and what we think about piñatas today, the meaning is really just a, this kind of celebration and everybody had these positive associations. And I thought, how could I use piñata, the piñata as this kind of visual language to kind of do the same thing as this tool of subversion. And so I also started thinking about ideas of text and language and and how things don't really translate correctly over into English and I thought what a great metaphor for the misunderstanding of two cultures that are living together um, and so like this this first example is like the middle which and, and it's important to note that these aren't like phonetically correct right like I mean these aren't like properly spelled uh, the, these are more phonetically correct and so for me it was these were things that I saw scribbled on the bathroom or said as a salutation. And there was like these slang idioms that I was really interested in. And then, but also like, you know, pieces like this, you know, te jodiste, you know, like for me, that was something my grandmother always said to me or, you know, to kind of prevent us from getting into trouble. And, and so it kind of says like, you messed up or you, you effed up. It depends, right? Because my I'm half Guatemalan and half Mexican American. And so, you know, even language between those two countries are different. And I, and I find that really fascinating. So incorporating all this kind of language into there, I just thought was really interesting. And then also dropping the accents as well, because, you know, as young, as a young Latino, right, we, I think for me, I, there was this pressure to assimilate into whiteness in a sense, you know, uh, and, and so that's kind of like, you know, what that implies when we think about the the language and, and how it doesn't really translate. So like no I bell mean, means like there's no problem, right? And it's kind of comedic as well. But when you tr you translate it that over, it, it means like there's no fart. And I, and I <laughs> and so for me, I, I thought that was just like an interesting phrase to kind of incorporate in the work, and then also incorporating other elements that that immigrants use, right? Because they are part they are the major part of the workforce. So as you can see, like there's like some Tyvek sampling um, on the sides. And, and then the other one, you know, I, I kind of stuck some kind of cement uh, texture on, on the sides of it as well. And then really, as I started progressing as an artist, I started thinking about how do I break free from the, 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 the constraints of, of a painting, right? Because we know that, you know, sometimes we, we typically think of a painting as being, you know, inside a frame. And, and so I wanted to really expand you know, pass that and then sort incorporate language, but also thinking about, you know, like with this piece in, in uh, you know, apasiguate, it's just like, it's, it's something that, you know, my, my former mother-in-law used to tell my kids, like behave yourself, right? And I thought about that idea uh, as, you know, Mexican-Americans, you know, we, 
I think in some regards, we, we, we become very submissive. Um, we're here to do work. We put our head down, we go to work, we don't make any trouble. And, and so kind of playing into that, this idea of a fear within communities, right? Especially migrant communities. Um, and, and then really thinking about how, what my upbringing was like. So this one, Muy Escondido is like, you know, well hidden and, and, and thinking about how my mother's family from Guatemala, you know, like in the 1950s after the coup happened where the US government came into Guatemala and overthrew uh, the democratic uh, elected president to install a dictator and how a large portion of, you know, of, of people from um, Guatemala had to go into hiding and, and no difference with my family. And then we eventually kind of migrated and especially in the eighties when we had all these civil wars. And, and so there's this complex history that most Americans don't really know about. And, and so for me, I wanted to explore those ideas. Um, but, you know, these pieces were derived from these public kind of guerrilla art placemaking things that I was doing. And in, in this was uh, probably about six or seven years ago. Oak Cliff is, you know, like I said, predominantly Hispanic and, you know, Mexican American, actually really more uh, Latin American, like there's Guatemalans, Salvadorians. And, and, and so for me, there were changes happening, of course, gentrification and displacement. Um, and I started noticing all these old places that I grew up going to were being torn down and left for vacant for a, a long time until a developer came. And, and of course, there's a, a, a bunch of other things behind that. But, you know, it was one day at this stoplight that I noticed that it kind of clicked that, oh, wait a minute, they're not building anything for the existing community for working class and working poor people. They're building for the new community coming in. And you can tell by the the prices, right, of, of what they're building. And I thought, you know, for this commercial real estate sign was really a, a, a notion of planting a flag, right? This colonial idea, like this is, this is ours now because we can own it. Uh, and, and I have to say like a large percentage uh, of people who live in Dallas, are, there's actually more renters than there are homeowners. Uh, I think 60% are renters. And so I thought, how interesting would it be if I could create a pinata real estate sign that mimicked the real one and what and how those two things would communicate, right? So one is communicating with a different demographic. The other is communicating, um, you know, about possibilities of wealth and, and, and creations of wealth. The other one is just surviving. And then I, I like the idea that these things were also in this aesthetic, aesthetic skirmish that was happening between each other, um, that, that they were talking to different audiences. They were completely uh, made out of different materials. One sleek manufactured, those one craft and tactile. And for me, I, I thought uh, it was important to use language that was also a, a form of a question, but also uh, a statement. So quien manda is like, who runs things? Who's the boss? Is it going to be us? Because in Oak Cliff, we are the majority. And at that time, even now, like our representation was not reflective in local government, was not reflective of the community. And so they, actually, this was the very first one. And just to kind of go to show, like, I didn't realize how big this sign was until I, and my sign that I made was like about eight, uh, eight feet tall. Uh, and so this, this, this was huge, right? So I had to start going out and measuring so I could replicate it. And so there's just some more examples of how intricate they became as well. And no, I, by the way, at that time, I was like, you know what, the, the, at, at that moment when I was creating these, it was symbolic of like, you know what, just like any working class community, we we get to work and we don't complain. It's no big deal, right? But you know, this the city of Dallas where I live, you know, they always have the thumb um, on the scale, and they choose the winners and they choose the losers, and and that's usually through the form of de development and businesses, you know. And so for me, you know, it was it, it was important to kind of call to uh, attention to what was happening within this city and how working class and working poor people were basically getting pushed out. And, and so for me, there was this narrative that was being created by developers in Dallas, like, especially in Oak Cliff, look how great development is in Oak Cliff. Because before that there was, you know, nothing but tire shops and, 
and run down businesses. But the thing was, what they don't tell you is that if it wasn't for Latinos and Latina families to come into a neighborhood, because in the 60s and 70s, white flight happened and they, and you know, white families left, but it was Latino and Latina immigrants who came in, bought houses, created businesses, put their kids in failing school systems when no one else wanted to. We saved this neighborhood. And just like throughout all cities, um, immigrant cities, immigrants save these cities, right? Detroit is a really great example. And, and shout out to A.K. Sandoval Strauss, who wrote this really great book called Barrio America and, and how Latinos immigrants saved America. And, and, and that book, which is so interesting, Inter, uh, instrumental because it it made me realize all <laughs> everything that I was thinking was actually was so correct and and he backs it up by tons of data and so for me it became really how do I energize this community and make them believe that you know their voice matters and they have a say so in the direction of their community so I continue to kind of create these these phrases like so for example this means like who will stop them um, and, and so. For, for me, I felt like it was important to empower, you know, our community for, you know, because when you grow up in a working, working poor community, you know, you're told constantly how, basically how bad your neighborhood is. Um, you're in some ways kind of vilified and, and also like told that you're not going to be anything, right? And so for me, this piñata was a form of, of a visual communication, a visual language that I could use uh, for my community. And, and just through, through luck, you know, I, I, I got a lot of success out of this, you know, the, this was a digital print in Houston, and it was a public art project that was, that was opened up, and, you know, they, they selected it, right, and, and then I won a grant from the National Sculpture Museum, and it was during, I was, and around this time, I was becoming heavily involved in local politics, because I feel like that's, that's the starting point, right, because it's it's one thing to get people to turn out to vote for the president. That's easy. That's easy, right? But it's a lot harder for for people in, in local communities to come out and vote for a local election because they don't see those changes. Because how it's set up, especially here in Dallas, like uh, poor people, immigrants, um, uh, they are not important because they don't vote. Um, and my thing has always been: it's not that we don't vote. This is you've never given us a reason to vote because you ignore us. And so I, you know, I, I, I received this grant and, and I created these little yard signs uh, that said Ken Manda, like who, who rules, who runs things. And you know, put, th um, put these messages on buildings um, just to kind of get people talking about, you know, local elections. And then I, I, I actually, I think it made it its way up to the Bronx. And, and so through another grant, um, and then, you know, through my, for me, the, you know, being involved politically and, and going to community meetings was really informative. And, and then I realized that, uh, that things really hadn't changed that much since I was a kid. You know, my mother oftentimes was, would be on her own and she, would, I remember seeing her struggle and moving from one rent house to the other when the rent would go up. And, and I went to this one community meeting um, held by the Texas Tenants Union, which is an organization that advocates for tenants' rights. And Sandy Rawlings is the executive director. And I remember this woman got up and she she was in tears. And it still affects me today when I when I reflect on that. You know, like I can't help but like not tear up. But she was like, I'm about to get evicted and I don't know where to go. And I got kids. And that moment I knew, you know, there had to be a different conversation, right? Because it, it, we, when we see it in Dallas, it was just data points, you know, like we couldn't really put a face on it. And so for me, I teamed up with Sandy and she was so gracious to kind of collaborate with me. And I was like, you know, I got this crazy idea. I want to create these little sad pinata houses and go put them out into the community. And, and, and so, you know, these are kind of some of the stats that, uh, you know, how, how long, and I'm sure Los Angeles <laughs> is a lot worse than Dallas, but, you know, it takes 82 hours if you work a minimum wage job to afford a one bedroom house in Dallas. And, and so for me, I decided I was going to put these objects out into the community. And the very first round that I did was a Christmas Eve. And because and, and, I knew people were going to be with their families and they were going to be reflecting about family. And, but also, 
it was people were going to be evicted at the end of the month, right? They were looking for, you know, homes and or rentals. And so, uh, you know, uh, this project, you know, was kind of like probably about over a year just creating these little sad pinata houses. And, and for me, I thought, I thought it was really, it was really poignant because I wanted these things to be really sweet and, and super saccharine. And I wanted people to kind of, I wanted to tug at their heartstrings like, hey, wait, this is an important issue, affordable housing in Dallas, and, and we need to pay attention to it. But also, I didn't just want to create awareness, you know, I wanted to give a platform to the Texas Hanch Union, which is the organization I, I collaborated with. And, and so for me, it was about create an action item. And, and so we developed uh, this postcard that was attached to each of the houses, like a little pocket. And so when someone would walk up to it, they would pull the postcard and it gave them an opportunity to advocate for affordable housing because it was pre-addressed to the mayor's office in Dallas. And, and, and also informed individuals about how hard it was to make it in Dallas. And so this is like the first round of the postcards that came, came with it, right? Um, and, and that was the back. And, and then we, I did another round for um, Valentine's Day. And, and so I felt like it was pretty successful. I had a friend in the mail room and, and they would send me like snapshots of people mailing these postcards in. So I thought that was a really great way to kind of for advocacy. But, but also I think for me, it was important to give Sandy Rawlings from Texas Senate Union a platform to really speak about these issues. And, and because of, I'd never imagined how big this project would, would kind of blow up. And, and so every time the news would call me or write a story, my first thing was like, this is great and I really appreciate it, but you have to talk to Sandy Rawlings because she has something to say that's important. And so, you know, it was this really beautiful journey, but uh, the interesting thing is that um, the, the, the amount of press that, that got picked up was actually kind of overwhelming for me because I was working a full-time job and trying to answer questions and interview. And, and, and so for me, it, it was great to have Sandy kind of jump in sometimes. And so these pinatas would make, they were making their rounds through the, the local news um, channels. And, and we made a, we, we, we did a parade as well. This is members of the Texas Heritage Union, uh, which I will always be forever grateful for because I didn't think I was this crazy artist. <laughs> but what I loved about it was the social engagement of these little houses and, and how people were attracted to them. And, 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 and so one thing that I really appreciate when you put things out into the universe, you never know what's going to happen or, or how they'll change. And, and this is one example of, I put this little guy out he disappeared for two weeks, which is normal because sometimes they'll stay there and they'll wither away. And I think that's really um, poignant. And but sometimes I, I won't ever see them again. But then he, he came back really angry. And obviously, everyone knows what GTFO means um, and gentrifiers. Right. And I remember like on social media, people were questioning me because they, they were like, they thought I had did it. And they're like, Gio, we thought you were all about creating awareness and, and not really being divisive and, and, and my thing was like, it wasn't me, but I think it's important that the existing community who feels this pressure, it's important for us to hear them. And it's okay if they're upset because they have every right to be upset because they're losing their house, right? They can't afford the payments on it right? and they're forced to sell. So I, I felt like that was important contribution to the dialogue. And they would also end up at other people's houses uh, and like this form of solidarity, I think. Um, I, you know, I think I, we even got like a, <laughs> a ransom letter through an email, like we got your pinata house. And I was like, you can keep him. He's basically a cardboard box. <laughs> so, um, but for me, what was really meaningful if when they were allowed to stay, um, they would eventually deteriorate and disappear. And I thought it was, it was really um, poetic. And that's what this community was facing, that the immigrant and the Latino families who live here were basically withering away in the culture that comes with it and the vibrancy as well. So uh, speeding along, uh, 
what I didn't anticipate were people saying, what, what's next, Gio? What are we going to do? And so for me, it, it came, my background is, uh, is in teaching. So I thought, okay, well, let's start educating our community. And I teamed up uh, with another really great organization, uh, Legal Aid of Northwest Texas, and, and they were doing a zoning 101 class. And, and I thought it was fantastic that, that they were doing these classes in these communities that had no idea what zoning is. And usually when we think about zoning, that's the first tool when a, a, a community begins to change, right? The developer goes in and changes the zoning and a lot of us don't even know what that means. So it was important to kind of educate. However, you know, like uh, through all this advocacy and, and doing educational clinics and organizing with other groups, like with Somos Tejas, uh, which is a great shout out to, to Ramiro, Luna Henejosa, who is this amazing organizer. Um, I started finding out quickly that advocacy wasn't enough. My art practice wasn't enough because things weren't changing. And, and you know, there was this news segment, right? Of these, these families getting kicked out. And so we, we kept seeing this pattern, like this city did not care. And, you know, most recently it was with COVID and these long food distribution lines and, and then also like vaccine lines and, and, I, for me, the most egregious thing was that that individuals who the city had set up these kind of vaccine registration lines, and so you had all these people here who who didn't really know like the 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 process. So a lot of them thought that they were actually going to get the vaccine, but actually they're standing in line so they can get registered to go wait in another line, and it just comes down to priorities, right? Like. For us, you know, our elected officials, you know, like they, some of them just didn't see the importance. And so throughout, out of that, I was really moved by it. And I thought about my mother's own experience, right? When she came here and, and how she bought her first vehicle. And what does that mean? Like, you know, when we think about the American dream and automobiles and the American open road. And for us, you know, in this gig economy that we live in, working poor and working families, that that relationship with that vehicle is no longer like the 1950s. And, and for me, you know, it was also indicative of this transitory nature that we have as immigrants because we're constantly moving. And I thought about my mom's vehicle, which is the 1985 Nissan Sentra. And it was our, our liberation, right? We were, we were no longer dependent on, you know, rides from family members or friends. We were no longer dependent on this, the, the, the uh, transportation system, which still sucks, by the way. <laughs> and so for me, I wanted to do something that honored my mother and the hardships that she went through, but also that spoke to the community. And so this piece was called Grit Grind. And it was at the Nasher Sculpture Museum. And, and so for me, um, you know, creating the vehicle without the wheel sitting on a center block was just so indicative of working people, right? Because there's, you know, there's never one thing that just happens. There's like a multitude of things, like one thing happens and then another bad thing happens, but we are resilient. And, and so for me, I wanted to portray that, right? in this kind of vibrancy. And, and, and so, and after it was done at the sculpture, uh, at the sculpture museum, I, I put it back into the neighborhood where I felt like it belonged. And, and, and so it, it sat there for about a month or so and it started to wither away. And again, and what I love about that you know, these objects that I put out are just as fragile as the communities that live in them. And, and what I felt like was really comedic about this piece that just like any abandoned vehicle, right, things start to um, start to go uh, missing. So eventually, like everyone had taken the wheels. I don't know where they went. Uh, this was like during the process uh, where the wheels are still there, but they had been taken off. And then people were writing like these kind of fake citations on top of it. So I thought it was really interesting. Um, but going back to what I said earlier is like advocacy only went so far. And, and so I, as I often do give artist talks, um, and I always emphasize the importance of voting and, and I went to this one high school and I was finished my artist talk and talked about the importance of voting. And, and this one student, I will never forget, he got up and he said, you know, Giovanni, thanks for coming out. But, but I, I just want to ask you something. I want to get this straight. You want me to vote for someone who doesn't look like me, who doesn't come from my neighborhood, who doesn't understand the struggles that my parents go through to try to make it? You want me to go vote for a rich white guy? And I was just 
blown away. Because here I thought I was like dropping knowledge on him. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to get these young people to come vote. But what he was saying back to me was that I don't see myself reflected in this political process. So yeah, I don't have every, I don't have any intention on voting. And that's when I knew that like, I had to go run for local office so I could, so I could kind of prove to the community that a regular person from the neighborhood could represent this area. And so, but also recognize the opportunity. So this is the map of the district that I live in for city council and the yellow circle areas, um, areas are the, 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 the neighborhoods with the highest turnout in voting, which they tend to be kind of wealthy and white and they know the importance of their vote, right? And that's why they turn out in droves and voting and the rest of the map it's predominantly Hispanic. Now there's some, you know, it's, it's kind of generalized it. There's some more other pockets, but it's kind of the makeup. And Dallas is dead last in all 50 US major cities in voting. And so it typically takes about 2000 votes to win a city council race. So when I decided to jump in, I knew that our, our race had to be different. It, it couldn't be like the red, white, and blue colors. We had, just like with my own art practice, we had to absorb all the colors and, and vibrancy in our community. And so I, <laughs> I, I begged all my artist friends to kind of help, help me with my campaign as long with, along with other people. And we created you know, material that spoke to the community, that used the language that our community understood like protect neighborhoods from greedy developers, as opposed to like, I'm for, you know, economic development. No one in our neighborhood knows what that means. But most importantly, we were about going into these neighborhoods and knocking on doors, letting them know that they had a voice. And so our mailers were different. We were talking about the real issues that were affecting our community. You know, we weren't sugarcoating anything because one thing about, you know, our communities, you know, we. We know when we're being hustled because we, we are on the hustle every day. So you can't just walk up in here and, and, and say, hey, I'm gonna be for you all. Like you gotta come with authenticity. And I felt like that's what we gave our community. And shout out to uh, Ryan and Rachel who were so instrumental in developing the branding for us. And, and, and they live in Oak Cliff and, and I went to graduate school with them and they were just super fantastic. And, and I, I, I couldn't have done this without my team. And so we did an amazing job. We were out raised by, I think, 20 to one. <laughs> and we, we fell short. Um, you know, I, I, I lost by like 1300 votes. However, this past year, I decided to run again because of COVID. And I felt like there wasn't an emphasis on helping, our, helping out our Latinx community. So I decided to jump in really late. And we actually won more precincts than we did to um, back in um, 2019. And we lost by uh, four, 479 votes and we needed 80 votes for a runoff. And so towards the end uh, now, for me is important that representation is, is needed in our community because we never know who's looking, right? And my whole thing was like, I did it for, for our community to empower them to say, you know what, if, if Gio could do it, some like artist um, with, with no wealth, no, like I'm not rich, you know, I'm not an attorney. I don't have all these connections with the city. I'm a regular person. And if, if I could do it, maybe one day this young man could do it too, to represent his community. I want to thank everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the, all the panelists. And, and that is it. So incredibly compelling and inspiring what you've done. I mean, I, I don't know too many artists, uh, even those, you know, in social justice practices who run for office. Um, I hope this encourages more to, to, to get out there and be as active um, as that is pretty phenomenal. So. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, we, we definitely need more artists running for office. <laughs> You're some of the most smartest people I know. I think so. I think uh, everyone probably here today would agree with that. Um, <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, it also speaks to fundamentally the power of art to inspire people to act. Um, but taking it to that degree is, is just phenomenal. So I'm going to invite Diana and Isais to join us again. Um, we've gone over a little bit, but um, I think this discussion is 
so incredibly important and you're all so inspiring to <clears throat> comments. So I'm gonna invite any questions to be added, but my, my question to you all is um, the idea that um, Isais, in terms of his piece, Resilience, that's an aspect of all of your work so so critical and um you pointed out how it's both resilience and resistance um and i just think in terms of the material itself the way that you interpret it let alone the messages that you're incorporating wonder if you'd all like to speak on that a little bit further and also give people a chance to add some questions if they'd like um i think you know i think that's fundamental to the to what pinatas are overall, and you all take that concept a lot further in in your work. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to speak to that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I would just like to say, you know, even the um, for me too, the craft of the pinata um, and how um, Latinos, you know, are looked at in this world, how they are. Um, you know, given these caricatures, these these um, these images, and and they're used like a product, and you know they're propped up, they're celebrated, and then they're beaten up, thrown away, and discarded. You know, and um, I want to you know show people how powerful you know it is to see things like that, and also to participate. You know, because there is a level. I we're losing your audio. He says, unfortunately, we'll move on. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Isais, but we're, we, we're losing our audio right now. We can't oh, sorry. I was just going to say it, it puts people in a position to recognize how they participate in this world. And that's what I love about this. You know, it's not just, oh, look at that. You know, but piñatas, you know, you have to participate. You have to grab the stick. You got to beat the thing. You know, um, you got to line up. You know, and you, you got to do these things. And so it's it's the it's being the verb that's interesting to me in regards to this craft and how accessible it can be. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wonder for all of you if um, the idea of scale—that's something that comes through uh, both large and small. Do you all talk about about that a little bit more, Diana? You started talking about that in some of your work. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, it's very important to uh, play around with scale, whether it's a uh, tiny uh, work or a very large pieces. Um, it, it helps to uh, exemplify the, the statement that you're trying to make. Um, and like, like I mentioned, the series of work calling, uh, asking for it by maximizing the size of tampons, of birth control, of morning after pill, things that have are heavy with stigma and taboo, um, that brings the opportunity for conversation to start, even if it's in the gallery setting. Um, I remember when I showcased this work um, as an undergrad at UC San Diego, um, I saw a lot of conversation happening with the you know, young crowds and also like professors that would jump in and check out the, the exhibit. So definitely for me, scale is a, a great way to play with this craft. And um, yeah, I, I think that it's it's a very useful tool to use. Yeah, I, I feel like scale is important too. And, and for me, I guess it doesn't matter what size it is, but I think the importance is, is that it allows people to kind of let down their guard in the sense where it's approachable, you know, and, and like for me, like if, if it's like a large life-size object or even bigger or a smaller one, you know, there is this kind of um, this idea that it, it it allows people to let down their guard and then have this kind of genuine conversation about this, whatever the issue is or the object that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Isais, in terms yeah, of I mean, for me, you know, I flipped the script by going little, you know, my, 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 my thing is no bigger than my hand, you know, so, um, and the whole reason is that, you know, uh, I used to use this term when I created this thing called chueco, is, you know, what's chueco about this? You know, what's, there's always some wrong, crooked, something out of place. And so let's embrace that, you know? And so um, with my piñata, yeah, they're, they're small 
And so that visually flips you already. And then like you're, you're talking about very accessible because they're a piñata, you know? And so I like how the play on scale, um, even with like my piñata uh, border wall, um, because it was a small one that was a big one, you know, and how that impacted people's experience to the work, to the point that we were trying to make. And, uh, that, and that's what I love. That's what's in this exhibition is the level of scale that you have um, from the very small to the very, very big, you know. You all, uh, and I think there's an element uh, to the pinatas that has this dark humor and you've talked to all about it a bit. Can you elaborate on how you see that and you know what people take away and and maybe do people necessarily uh, how to how do people perceive these pieces and do they understand the humor aspect to it? Any of you want to jump in? Yeah, I think in my work um, I cover a lot of serious topics. Obviously, border politics are very heavy. Um, but I think like with um, Latin American humor, I think we try to, we use, uh, we use hope, I mean, uh, we use um, uh, humor to cope with uh, these sorts of heavy topics, you know, and um, I feel like that was something that I wanted to bring uh, into my practice because um, a lot of people who I work with, they know that one of the things that's very characteristic of me is humor and finding humor in the most dark uh, topics as well. Um, so definitely for me, being able to bring that part of my identity as uh, Latina, as Mexican, as transborder is important. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, humor is important. And, um, and so, it, at least in in the context of my work, you know, when you placing them outside, it it's uh it's, it's it serves as this form of interruption, right? When people are driving down the street and something pops up that's not supposed to be there, but it's also really, you know, playful. And and, and so again, it goes back to this idea of, of being subversive, where it allows people to let down their guard to have this conversation that needs to be had. Okay, well, we've gone over by a bit. Um, again, there's so many rich aspects to examine here and um, we've just begun and really begun also, I think hopefully opening up the possibilities for exploring pinatas um, and putting that out there that that is happening as, a, as an artistic format, um, a format for expression. That's what all of you are doing so brilliantly. So thank you for today and for giving us a very brief glimpse into what you're all accomplishing and we'll look forward to seeing much, much more. So thank you to each of you for today. Um, I also wanna thank the Los Angeles um, Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting this exhibition and its programming. And we'll look forward to more. So thank you to everyone who joined us today and Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Have a great day.